Greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I'm Steve Dace along with Totters and Aaron McIntyre. Coming up on today's program, we are looking forward to Dr. Pierre Corey joining us at the bottom of the hour. He's got a new column out over at the Hill. Is it long COVID or is it long COVID vax? We will get into that conversation coming up at the bottom of the hour. Next hour for Theology Thursday. This is the last Theology Thursday we're going to have. Next Thursday, we're off for our spring break. See that as the annual time I take off for the opening of the NCAA basketball tournament. Uh, And then we're going to start our series on Romans the following week, March the 28th. Okay, so this is the last Theology Thursday until then. And I'm going to walk you through my new book, Why Easter Jesus Died for Us So We Can Live Forever. If you want to know, hey, what's inside? Is this really a good fit for our family, for our school, uh, our church, etc.? We're going to walk you through that book and how it presents both law and gospel to children. And unfortunately, we're in a country of spiritual children nowadays were things that were just kind of taken for granted spiritually in every previous generation of America among the adult population no longer are. So this may be new information. This connection between the Old and New Testaments may be new information for a lot of you, even a lot of you that maybe are believers because you just haven't had this discipleship level in your church. And then also how the gospel helped to inspire the country that we live in. So we're going to walk you through why Easter coming up in Theology Thursday next hour, and then we'll discuss it amongst ourselves uh, for the rest of the time we have. And again, if you want to get your copy, they're available right now at Amazon.com. Why Easter? Jesus died for us so we can live forever. And if you've already had a chance to buy it or to read it and you wouldn't mind leaving us a review on Amazon, we would greatly appreciate that as well. And if you want signed copies or customized signatures made out to people specifically, you can go to signedwhyeaster.com, signedwhyeaster.com for that. And thank you to all of you that have helped uh, to make this a successful launch of the second in my trilogy of books, uh, children's books on America's Christian heritage. So that'll come up for the Theology Thursday, and then we'll have three non-political questions. Of course, we're brought to you every day by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company. There is a flavor for every freedom-loving American, but we don't promote them just because they align with our values. That's not good enough for us. You got to actually make a good product, okay? So, for example, I was driving over to the uh, studio this morning, and I am driving behind uh, some folks going 10 in a, in a 35, and then uh, they, they, they stopped at a green arrow right turn and just stopped and waited for the light to turn red. And uh, then they proceeded, as the, as the light was red, you can turn right on red on this street, there is no car coming, and they just sat there until the light turned green again. Now, was I happy with their driving? You're a patient man, I'm sure I, you... I'm well known. <laughs> the tales of my patience have been... I mean, children have been regaled for generations of sagas, legends, in fact, have been told about my levels of patience for such tomfoolery. Yes, it's, it's a well-known thing. One of the first things that comes up when anybody re- mentions my name. Oh, you mean the guy that is really patient with fools? That guy. Yeah, it's well-known. No, I, 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 spoiler alert, no, I was not having positive feelings. But right before I was about to lay on my horn, I look down and there's a Jesus fish on the back. And there's, uh, you know, all kinds of Christian iconography and imagery on the back of their car. That wouldn't stop me. I'm sorry. (laughs) It did. All right. So I didn't approve of their driving. Okay. But I, I, I gave them a break because they're on the team. All right. But, but I did not approve of their driving. Okay. So we wouldn't promote this coffee because it has our values. If it sucked and it had our values, I'd treat them like that, that car I ran into on the way to the studio this morning. I just would say nothing. But you first have to make a great product. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you owe them something. A su- you have to purchase their substandard service or product because they share your value system. At least until the Antichrist comes and divides us all uh, with the mark. You don't have to do that. So don't. So we promote First Cup Coffee because it's really good coffee. It's a bonus and a good one 
that they also share our values. All right. So uh, it is shipped within days of being roasted. They'll put the roast on date right there on the bag. So you know that for sure. Uh, Go to firstcup.com. Use the code DACE to save 10% off. Firstcup.com. Promo code DACE to save 10% off. And if you subscribe, you get another 10% off uh, for the life of your subscription. You can't beat it. And then speaking of subscriptions, one last thing here. I mentioned this yesterday. If you have not yet seen this, it's this Blaze original series that we are doing on what's going on on the border episode three being released today on blaze tv if you want to subscribe one of the most important things in this episode without spoiling it is it's going to show you in a a very specific example of how president biden acted to stop one particular influx of of migrants And, and it worked And Mexico actually, after his call, stepped in. Which, of course, means if they could do it once, what does that mean? More. They could be doing it more. But I don't want to spoil it. You need to see this for yourself. It's a very important part of uh, this story uh, from our Blaze original team. All right. So if you want to see this, uh, blazeoriginals.com. Use the code border crisis to get $30 off your Blaze TV subscription. Blaze TV uh, is where you want to go to see Blaze Originals border crisis. Blazeoriginals.com. Use code border crisis to get $30 off at blazeoriginals.com with the promo code border crisis. And with that, here is Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by trans hoax number 666. We now know that the teenager in Oklahoma whose death the media was quick to blame on libs of TikTok's Shea Rashik and Oklahoma Superintendent of Public Instruction Ryan Walters was not the result of a fight in a high school bathroom. She actually sadly committed suicide via overdose. The media told us that 16-year-old Nex Benedict, who identified as non-binary, among other things, was the target of bullies in a school bathroom where she was beat up and died from her injuries. Subsequent alternative reporting, however, showed she had actually started the fight at the Owasso, Oklahoma High School, and that school nurses decided nobody actually needed to go to the hospital. Benedict was dead the next day, and now, according to the state medical examiner, she died from an intentional overdose of depression medications. And now a roundup of deep thoughts with Dems in D.C. Here's Nancy Pelosi. This is not an attempt to ban TikTok. It's an attempt to make TikTok better. Tic-tac-toe. A winner. Janet Yellen. In 2021, you, though, you did say that inflation was transitory. Do you, do you regret saying that now? I regret saying it was transitory. Um, it has come down, but I think transitory means uh, a few weeks or months to most most people. Joe Biden. Wages are rising faster than prices, and now we have among the lowest inflation rates of any country in America, and still we're still fighting to lower it even further. And a Kamala Bledy Gook update. And that is not all. If he is reelected, the former president has openly said he intends to weaponize the Department of Justice against his enemies. Meanwhile, in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis is mobilizing even more state law enforcement in an effort to heighten maritime security in the Sunshine State. Over 200 additional members of state law enforcement from multiple agencies are being deployed in an effort to make sure any mass illegal immigration attempts from Haiti are thwarted amidst continued insurrections led by criminal gangs in that country. West Point Military Academy has dropped the phrase duty, honor, and country from its military statement. While the motto was officially introduced in 1998, the phrase was initially featured in a famous speech by General Douglas MacArthur in 1962. The phrase is going to be replaced with the words Army values, according to Superintendent Lieutenant General Steve Gilland. The Lieutenant General claimed the new mission statement, quote, binds the academy to the Army, while duty, honor, and country is foundational to the United States Military Academy's culture, and, quote, will all Always remain our motto. March 14th, 2024, a day after Donald Trump declared a national emergency over the coronavirus pandemic. The day Black Mirror update was coined by Todd as he was hanging out with his daughters at the mall. And the day the most powerful man in the world popularized the phrase social distancing. The media, of course, was already in full on panic mode. Four years later, one of the few, maybe the only voices of reason, at least for a little while, in the White House during that time, Dr. Scott Atlas of Stanford sat down with Dell Bigtree at the High Wire and discussed the legacy of the age of COVID. I believe part of that legacy is a complete loss of basic civility in this country. And uh, so we have a a cohesion problem. We We have a moral and ethical failure 
of shifting the burden toward poor people and toward our children. And we have a, a massive failure, if you want to be uh, going into philosophy, of what it is to be a virtuous society. The kind of society we thought we had, the kind of society you, you must have in a free society, in a democracy where there's a diversity of views. And what is the biggest absence in our country? It's an absence of courage. Okay, we have a void in courage in the people. That's what we have seen, in my view. And as Aristotle has said, the cur courage is a predicate to all other virtues. Uh, you know, you can't have a functioning moral civilization, ethical civilization, if you don't have people have the courage to speak up against wrong. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's Montage brought to you by our friends over at New Founding. They want to do something about uh, the wokeness, the DEI, the ESG that has infiltrated and infested much of corporate America. They want to get back to companies that just made great products, provided great services, provided a living for their employees, and benefited society as a whole by doing so. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, in other words, building the parallel economy, New Founding is looking for venture investors that can help them do exactly that. They go through every one of their applicants and ask a simple question. Does this country we want to live in need the company that this person is building? And if the answer is yes, they proceed. If the answer is no, they don't. Uh, you can join in venture investing. It's not for everybody. But if you're a serious accredited investor uh, who wants to see a more hopeful future for the country, go to newfounding.com backslash venture fund and apply to be an investor. Again, that's newfounding.com backslash venture fund to join their venture fund today. Okay, um, let us go to Aaron's montage. And is anybody surprised that we have had yet another tranny hoax. Now, this is a this is a tragedy. And I think we had a study came out a few days ago, didn't we, that showed the suicide rate of those who succumb to these surgeries is way higher than those um, who we deny them to or it who doubles. don't go through with it. Yeah. OK. And I, I think this is probably another example of that. Yeah. Um, the lies get out of control. And this really, in many respects, ties into what Scott Atlas was just talking about. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I think it was last week, that I found the uh, original broadcast of the, uh, the 1980 U.S. Olympic game at Lake Placid. It's actually the semifinals. A lot of people, we forget the gold medal game was the, the U.S. had to win against the Soviets to get to the gold medal game. So they didn't win the gold medal that night. Uh, but they beat a Soviet team that just, what was it, like a month or two prior, had beaten them like 10 to 1 or something. And during the previous year had done a barnstorming tour of America where they beat some NHL teams. In fact, I think one of them, I think, was the Islanders who were like one of the big teams at that, in that era. And so they were considered to be invulnerable. And the U.S. pulled off that great upset. Do you believe in miracles? I'm a, you know, I'm a six-year-old kid staying up late watching that broadcast. And I hadn't seen it. I mean, I've seen the movie Miracle, which is great. I had a chance in my early in my sports writer uh, career life to meet Herb Brooks. He had come to Des Moines to scout our minor league hockey team that I was covering. And I got to sit up in the press box with him for an entire game and just hang out and pick his brain. Oh, and he could not. That. Yeah, he, I don't think have I, have I never told you that he could not have been more gracious, by the way, you know, and um, and I can still remember as I watched as I watched this replay on YouTube a couple of weeks ago. And we get down to those last two minutes of Al Michaels call and the hair in the back of my neck stands up and I, I still have these feet. I still feel like I did staying up late to watch this on this little TV screen in my bedroom at six years old. Okay. Um, you know, on a school night to watch this event, you know, and, and that's one of the formative events of my childhood. I, I'm a child of the eighties. I grew up in the, we're America bitch era. That we were the shining city on the hill, that, that we were the beacon of hope to the world. And therefore, that meant we had a responsibility to shine that whenever that opportunity arose. And you and I are kind of of the same vein where mm -hmm. that is concerned. So how did I go from that to where I am today? Which is, 
you're not having my son. You're never taking him. You're sure as hell not taking my daughters. That's never happening. But you're not even taking my son for your Habsburg dynasty pissing contest in Kiev. Never happening. Or any of these other wars of conquest. Never happening. And leave me the hell alone unless there's a Red Dawn scenario in my own town. Not my, not my problem. How did I get there? I married a woman who grew up with a, with a father. I went to his military funeral two years ago, 101st Airborne. She's a graduate of Fort Campbell, Kentucky. So she's about as it were America bitch as you can get. She grew up like that. That was my ideology. So how did we get here? Well, it, that same father-in-law who I, I adored and rarely heard him make a single partisan political point in all the years that I knew him. I mean, he kept that honor code in the army of you do not criticize the commander in chief. I mean, he kept that pretty strict even years after his retirement. And one day when Noah was just learning to eat on his own and he's sitting at the table eating a bowl of cereal, Bob walks up to me out of nowhere and whispers, whatever you do, don't let him enlist. And it blew my mind. He goes, not the same army that it was. I mean, this is, this is the man that when I took him to West Point with me, I, I covered Iowa State football professionally early in our marriage. And, and Iowa State played a game on a Friday night at Army. And I got to go with the team and be on the campus of West Point. And I, I took Bob with me on that trip. He never had a chance to, to go to West Point. And I mean, I, I watched him literally as we toured that campus that day. I mean, he had tears in his eyes. And now, and that was two years before Noah was born. And now, what, five years later, he's telling me, no. Did you see the story in Aaron's montage? We're going to alter the motto. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about that. All the stories of people I've heard, veterans who were purged because they refused to be an experiment, to be poisoned, loss of rank, pension. And then this week, the UK announced, it's public health announced, they're no longer going to permit puberty blockers for children. Here's what that means for us. There have, in my lifetime, really been two crimes against humanity in my lifetime. Operation Warp Speed and what we're doing to our children right now with mutilating them. Which country was the primary driver of both? We're at the top of that list. Yeah, this one. mutilation before or after the they exit the birth canal exactly i i just i don't know how else to react to that all my we're america bitch patriotism slash really jingoism at that stage it's all gone it, it just doesn't exist i can't even believe it you know it's bad maybe maybe they are worried there's, there's two events today that make me think, okay, I always tell you guys, the internal numbers poli- that the parties and the politicians have is, are always better than our own, right? I've said that for years, mm-hmm. okay? And to always follow their behavior. Their behavior will tell you what's really going on. One event occurred in the Senate about an hour ago. We're going to discuss that in the overtime today. Another is Janet Yellen admitting a mistake. When was the last time anybody with a D after their name on any front and hell, just about anybody with an R after their name on any front. I was just going to say, I haven't looked uh, at Twitter since you started talking. Have you tweeted Janet Yellen didn't kill herself yet? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even even the, the thing about calling Lake and Riley's murder an illegal, the White House actually came back a couple of days later after Joe Biden told MSNBC he should have used the term un- undocumented. The White House came back and said, no, uh, we, we, we want to be clear. This was their words. We want to be clear. He did not apologize. Like, this is what you're talking about. They never Correct. apologize for anything. Ever. Correct. I, I just... I mean, that's, that's the first amount. 
I don't know if I want to call it. It's somewhere between self-awareness and pandering. Without knowing, oh, it's way closer to pandering. And, and that's probably true, but without knowing them personally, it's a harsh judgment to make. You know them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we're going to show humility? Maybe their internal numbers are really bad. And there's another event that seems to me it may indicate that that is the case particularly where one vital state is concerned. And I'll talk about that later today uh, in the overtime on Blaze TV. Uh, gentlemen, I want to get to your thoughts after we remind people about our friends over at Relief Factor. Uh, if you are struggling with chronic pain, that is no fun. And it just keeps coming back all the time. Sometimes it feels like nothing will make it go away. You can take drugs that will mask the pain, and that help, it helps for a little while, but those can come with side effects, particularly if you have to keep up in the ante of the dosage you're taking as your body adjusts. What if there was a supplement available that went after the cause of your chronic pain, that inflammation in your joints? That's why Relief Factor was created uh, by physicians who can prescribe drugs. So they prescribe some of those pain drugs I just described, but they realize that a lot of the issues here is just too much inflammation. Let's go after that and see if we can uh, fix the issues rather than masking them. Now, it's not a panacea. No, it's not 100% guarantee here. But over the years, over 1 million people have taken the three-week quick start from Relief Factor for just 20 bucks. And they have seen such great results in three weeks or less, they've stuck around long-term. That's 70% of the people that have done this. So those are pretty good odds. Give it a shot. What do you got to lose for just 20 bucks? See if you're in that 70% of people that sees a difference in three weeks or less. Get the quick start from Relief Factor. All right, go to relieffactor.com. The three-week quick start, just $19.95 at relieffactor.com. Gentlemen, your thoughts on uh, what I just laid out. Well, Aaron, in, in your explanation of, I, I, I've already retweeted the duty honor thing and i believe my response was probably hail hydra but i didn't look into the weeds of it yet i hadn't had a chance to and aaron in your description i just need to know did i hear you write their own explanation of this is that we want it to be less about identifying with american values and more exclusively with military values what they were attempting what that lieutenant general was attempting to communicate is that they want a duty on our country that phrase to be associated with the broader military and west point uh they want to have their own their own motto that's what I don't really buy that no. too, too much, but they're trying to say duty on our country is supposed to be associated with the entire military, not just the army. Well, whether it's explicit or... And these people, hold on, this is important. That yeah. argument, if that argument was made in 1972 or 1982, would this be a segment oh, on a show no. like this? No. We'd be cheering it even, on. Actually, even even 1992, 2002, nope. maybe even 2012. OK, why is it? Why is that something? Because these are the same people. What did they do before they altered this slogan? They trannied the military. They woke the military. They effeminized. The, you see what I'm saying? OK, they purged the military. Yeah. And so now they want to change. Now they want to change the words. That's what makes it suspicious, Todd. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And almost destined to go sideways in a really bad way, because without that 72, 82 uh, cultural mooring you're talking about, you are guaranteed that our military is going to end up have it being imbued with a uh, sensibility that is more akin, more far more akin to a mercenary army. That when they are told to do this or that against the American citizenry, they are far, far, far less likely to be like, no, those, I'm them and they are me. They're like, no, they're, they're going to have a sensibility of mercenaries. Um, this is, you told me to point my guns in this direction. Is the check going to cash? I mean, this is, this is a, I was, my jaw dropped. I mean, I'm so used to just like stupid sloganeering and mm -hmm. saying things like that. Like tic-tac-toe? But this like is, that, you mean? This is actively, to, in my mind, they're clearly programming a military to easily be turned on you. 
Tell me I'm wrong. You're not breaking any new ground. They fantasize about it. They openly fantasize about it. They fetishize it, no doubt about it. I mean, yeah. how many times have you heard a leftist, all the way up to Joe Biden, said, uh, what are you going to do with your AR when we've got F-15s? They openly Correct. talk about yeah. this. They openly fantasize about yeah. this. Um, I have I've been told that there are some very, very deep concerns in the near future about a kinetic war with China. And it's, that's not really a new thing. We've been talking about that a lot. In fact, that was Ron DeSantis's one of his major foreign policy um, kind of uh, dalliances was, uh, was the threat of China. And, and the thought of, you know, the re- retention numbers in the U.S. military, from what I've been told, are that women are actually staying in and men are the ones getting out. And the recruiting numbers, we've seen several stories already this year about recruiting numbers in across the board in the military are tanking. I believe it was the Daily Caller had the exclusive story a few weeks ago, and that 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 drop in recruiting is primarily driven by white, ostensibly men. We're heading towards a scenario where there's a real possibility of women being on the front lines in a hot kinetic war against a major superpower. That is awful. It's immoral. Pagan savages didn't send women to the front lines. In but, antiquity, they didn't do that. But if your solution to that is, well, that's why you need to join the military, go back to what we just talked about. Is America the number one exporter of human crimes against humanity in the last decade? Last maybe couple of decades? Forget the military the for cause, a second. The cause of America, bleep, yeah. I, I just, I, I'm not there. I'm not mm. there. I, I was back in the early 2000s. In fact, one of the first times I remember, Steve, I think this must have been 2006 or 2007, when you were first busting into WHO radio here in Des Moines. One of the first times I'm like, what the nerve on that guy talking about you. The first time I had one of those moments with you was when you criticized, you openly questioned the Iraq war, the mm-hmm. necessity of the Iraq war. Brother, you were way ahead of your time there. Well, and to, to the point about uh, Dr. Atlas and courage, Chris Rufo just tweeted about there's a, a middle school girl who went to a school board meeting and was talking about a boy in her bathroom. And Chris Rufo, uh, who's pointed out, I've never heard him say this, uh, this theme. I mean, he's been courageous, but he just said, our line. He said, where in the hell are all the dads? Why where is it always a girl or yep. a mom? Yep. So listen, guys, we, it's not even as much as joining the military. If you won't show up yeah. to the uh, these school board meetings and do the bare minimum, because whatever, you got a game to watch. I tell you what, you're good. You're going to have to be the sooner or later. You're going to be the lone guy in Tiananmen Square standing in front of a tank with nobody else coming to your bank. This is nothing new under the sun, guys. My son-in-law uh, re-enlisted in the guard because they offered because their recruit, recruit numbers are so down. They they just made him an offer for a young kid, a, a young married couple with a young family. He couldn't refuse, so he re-enlisted. He's already been to Iraq twice. They're telling him now his unit now here in Iowa to let their employers know that they may have to be deployed to Syria next year. Why? And I asked him, how would the result of this election? determine whether or not you know my my daughter's husband is going to waste a year away from his his child in syria for no apparent reason that's valid or productive on any level what do you think anything good will come out of that maybe nothing bad but i can't imagine anything good right. okay and he said it could have something to do with it yeah so here we are and we, we, and we can't even ban an app that is a clear conduit for our number one geopolitical strategic rival to inject rot gut into the culture because we can't trust government would then use that to then go after the stuff that we, we use to speak out against it. What a, what a corner we are in as a country right now. More in a moment. Well, something is up, and we'll be talking about um, 
at least one of those things here in a moment with Dr. Pierre Corey. But uh, if 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 you're seeing yet again another alarming rise in inflation, clearly it has uh, the White House back on its heels. They were not expecting it, and that's why you see the first bit of true um, self awareness and humility from Janet Yellen. Uh, yesterday saying, hey, I should have never mentioned transitory inflation. Uh, Just make sure you're prepared. You know, we're coming up, as Aaron mentioned in the montage, on the fourth anniversary of when the world almost ended. And we saw several things that we were convinced growing up, that could never happen here. And we saw several of those things happen here. Make sure you're prepared for the next time. Oh, that could never happen here happens here. Get with our friends at My Patriot Supply. Uh, They've got 22 food and drink varieties in their three-month emergency food kits. So plenty of uh, variety uh, if indeed you need to use their products. Over 2,000 calories a day. We're talking breakfast, lunch, dinner, even drinks and snacks. All sealed inside ultra-durable four-layer packaging, uh, which means they stay good for up to 24 years with proper storage. Uh, just make sure you're prepared and have that peace of mind and you can get, you're going to get $200 off each kit right now. $200 off each kit right now if you go to preparewithdace.com. They ship fast and free too. Preparewithdace.com. That is preparewithdace.com. Com. Well, I, I think it's it's a credit that this even managed to get published over at the Hill. Uh, but friend of the program, Dr. Pierre Corey, has a new piece out asking, is it long COVID or long vax? With a, a subsequent question, does the government want to know? And we welcome Dr. Corey back here to the program. It is good to see you again, sir. How are you? Definitely, Steve. Thanks for having me back. Let's start there. How did you even manage to get this uh, published over at the Hill? You know, tide, the tide has to be shifting here towards, you know, transparency, honesty, and truth. I, I mean, I don't want to overstate that, Steve. I mean, I, I still feel like I'm living through a dystopian time in terms of censorship, but it's a great question. I mean, something's different. I mean, I have published three op-eds, the first one in August on the excess mortality raging through this country. Um, one was in um, USA Today in August. Now, to, to your question, Steve, We didn't mention the vaccine when we talked about excess mortality in August. Then we did one in Newsweek where we were able to insert it as maybe something's around the vaccines with other things. But then in December or November, I published in The Hill on excess mortality and we literally called out the vaccines and I could not believe that got published. And now here we go again. I got to publish another one, which brings, you know, really hard questions around these vaccines. So the system wants to acknowledge what, what folks like you have been pointing out, uh, epidemic rises in autoimmune diseases, what we're seeing with the cancer rates among uh, the young, like people like ethical skeptic are pointing out on social media. The, the system, when it chooses to acknowledge these things, Dr. Corey wants to say it's because of long COVID. And if we're, if we're going to be intellectually honest, we have to say there, there is at least some claim for this in that we are dealing with a virus of anywhere from unknown to malicious origin that that is is clearly not entirely a natural phenomenon but part of some form of chimeric experimentation so we really don't know we we don't really know what long term even asymptomatic exposure to such a to such a concoction really even is we don't know that and so that does give them at least some form of a plausible cover story so then how do we draw a distinction between as you're trying to do uh, i think that can't be your catch-all here at some point we got to look at the fact we took the very spiked protein uh from that that chimeric concoction and injected it into hundreds of millions of people if not billions all over the world and we gotta we gotta finally confront and wrestle with that where do you draw that distinction i mean you practice medicine yourself with patients how do you draw it you know, uh, Steve, be clearer on your question. I'm sorry. Draw the distinction between what? Between long, a natural virus be, be, and a bioweapon? No, no between, no, between the fact you can call it long COVID because we don't know really where this virus oh. came from. So we can, we can project anything onto that as the reason why and not have yes. to actually look at the fact that we took the very spiked protein of that virus and injected it into billions of people. And maybe that's the reason why we're seeing some of these things. Yeah, yeah. So how would I? How, how do I? Cause so here's my practice, right? So I have uh, me and my partner. We've treated now and still treating about 1,200 patients. Seventy percent of patients who come to us 
are long vax. That's the term that we use. It's identical to long COVID. How do I make distinction? Very simply. Temporal association. What preceded the onset of the syndrome? And like I said in my practice, only 30% are long COVID. The vast majority will re will report in reliable, repeated patterns when their symptoms uh, onset. I have three different patterns. Some, I have one cohort, I'm going to say maybe 15% of my long vax started day of, within minutes to hours of the injection. The vast majority, maybe 70%, it started within days to weeks of the vaccine. And then I have a smaller cohort, maybe 5%, um, that it'll start quite a few weeks to months. Those are much more rare. It's, most of them are days to weeks. And and co long COVID is very similar. They recover from COVID. Most of them, they recover fully. And then the symptoms start to begin. And so it's not that hard to differentiate. I mean, and like I said, the majority is from the vaccine. And the thing that's central to both is the spike protein. One, you get exposed to spike. The other one, you're making spike. And the only big difference, Steve, between the two diseases is severity. On average, my vaccine syndrome patients are far sicker than my long COVID, with some a couple of exceptions. I think the answer you just gave is very important, Dr. Corey, because you're pointing out there is a chain of evidence, to use a phrase here, that we could follow to get to the origin of these maladies that isn't doesn't require some form of, you know, nine dimensional chess or, or jujitsu to, to figure out if it's a question of do we really truly want to know what the origins of these maladies are in these cases or not, if you're able to yep. track them as you just as, as you as you just indicated. Yeah. And, you know, there there's there there is a paper that was published maybe three or four months ago and i was a huge paper 250 references but it literally introduced the term spikeopathy and it went over all of the pathophysiology that we now know of the spike there's hundreds of papers showing the effects of spike protein in the body and, you know immune system effects autoimmune uh, immune dysregulation mitochondria uh, microclotting blood i mean it is we need, science actually needs to create a new discipline, which is called spikeopathy. We need to address this. This is causing immense amounts of illness. And as I already mentioned, death. And we have a pathogen that we've let loose uh, that, that is really sickening people. And and if, if medicine is able to admit this historic and grievous and catastrophic error and actually address this in a responsible scientific way, that's what they would do. But I, I don't see evidence of that, but I'm, I'm pushing. That's why I'm writing these op-eds. I'm trying to get people, you know, and, and the Hill published it. So it, it's going to be, we're entering people's minds and making people aware of stuff. Where are we three years after the jab was introduced compared to maybe what you were thinking when it was introduced about three years ago to the public? I, I can't even, I would have never, I couldn't even paint the picture of where we are, of how much damage uh, that vaccine has done. It's decimated lives. It It is caused, it has been the large part responsible for the drop in life expectancy in the in, in United States. I mean, we went from 79 to 76 in three years. Uh -huh. Who has to die for that? You know, the life insurance industry is reeling reeling from all of these death claims of young people you know our disabled disability roles are exploding you know we have real i think we're going to have real problems with the labor force and by the way as you and i get older steve i mean <laughs> the, the, the i don't know what the population of young people is going to be at this rate i, I mean I, I have the I even have crazy thoughts like that like wh wh how is this going to affect our society and we're going to keep walking along like everything's fine it's it's I could never have imagined this this scenario uh, three years ago, ever. I think people need to understand, in a, in a, when you're talking about a sample or a cohort, when you're dealing with life expectancy, it, it, this is a nation of 330 million people. Now, that includes children, obviously, okay? But we're, we're talking conservatively hundreds of millions of adults. And in a span of three years, you're telling our audience, life expectancy has dropped more than two full calendar years in the span of three years. Because here's what that also means, Dr. Corey, uh, 78, 79, and 80 and 81-year-old people dying because they can't fight off a respiratory right. virus isn't going to cause the lowering of, of life expectancy. It's going to be people much younger that we know 
were without uh, certain comorbidities like an autoimmune or a vitamin D deficiency from obesity, for example, largely recovered something like 99% or higher of the time of a COVID infection. So if you're telling us that we've seen that kind of a drop in life expectancy during this period, it cannot be from COVID-19 and what it did to the elderly because they already would have been largely at life expectancy. So this would have happened in age groups that were not particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. I mean, it's like you just did so elo- eloquent. This is simple arithmetic, right? If an average is going to go down that degree, you really have to lose lots of young people. And the most damning evidence is from the group life health insurance data, their, their quarterly report. And I've written about this extensively. And oh, by the way, the FDA chief even tweeted from the FDA that they recognize this. Now, it was followed by the usual, you know, laundry list of causes, um, you know, the, none of this, which included the vaccine because they're safe and effective. But the most damning on the vaccine is the group life health insurance uh, industry report, where when you look at quarter, uh, third quarter of 2021, you see an unprecedented, never before seen in that entire industry explosion in death claims in 25 to 34, 35 to 44. It's almost like we sent all our kids off to war, our young men off to war, or mm-hmm. women. And there's and then and nobody's talking about that. And I've worked with the life insurance industry on this is, issue, and you can tell they don't have an appetite to come out and, and really call this out public. A couple have. There's been some consultants who formed a consortium. They're getting out there, but you know all of this kind of work is getting censored. I mean, this is really getting buried. I mean, the the, the colossal nature of of the death and disability that has been unleashed. I mean, of course they don't want this to come out. I mean, it'll shred whatever remaining trust, and I don't know where that trust is in our agencies uh, for, for good. So while I have you here as someone that is actively treating over, you know, 1,200 patients right now uh, in this arena, I want to make sure because I'm going to get besieged with questions after we say goodbye in a few minutes. Hey, I took this. My job made me do it. I only took it once. What do I do? All right. Because we don't know how long that spike protein stays in your system. We're having a hard time with the censorship, as you mentioned, getting real studies done about this on a consistent level. So what advice would you say to somebody right now if they took one of these dosages of these mRNAs, would you have the same concerns if you only took the J&J shot, for example? How would you answer those questions? Um, I don't see that there's a big difference in how dangerous they are. Um, um, Number one, so it doesn't matter which one you have. My first piece of advice, do not get vaccinated ever again with an mRNA vaccine. Uh, Do not let family members get vaccinated. Next, I want to say a note of reassurance. From the epidemiologic data, It's my sense that the farther you are out from your last vaccine, the more likely you're going to be okay in terms of acute problems. Um, That is to say, dropping dead, heart attacks, strokes, all of those things. Those are generally occurring within the first days to weeks. And then there's other blips throughout the year. But after about a year, I think it's going back down to around baseline. So that's the acute stuff. Now, what to do about Spike? I would go to my nonprofit website, which is flccc.net. There is uh, one protocol we have on there. It's just suggestions of things that bind spike, that break down spike. You know, these are some of these are natural supplements. They're what's called proteolytics or fibrinolytics. And so, you know, we think, again, we have no data. No one's studying this. We don't have the research uh, apparatus or money to, to study it. But we're just putting out gentle, sound guidance, knowing mechanisms uh, for kind of safe supplements and medicines that you could use if you're really, really concerned. Um, I, I hope... I hope that the vast majority are going to be okay. And like I said, the farther you are out from your last one, I think your prognosis is much, much better. Is there a critical mass issue that you see in your practice or on the horizon in the data that you think could finally be what what blows open the Overton window here, that this is just at this point impossible to ignore, whether we're talking fertility rates, cancer rates amongst the youth, anything of that nature or something else? You know, I don't know what that trigger is going to be, Steve. I, I don't know what that final piece of data. I mean, you know, what I've found is that this is not a data argument. I mean, we've had the data for for years hmm. calling out this catastrophe. And, you know, but that's privately held knowledge. You know, common knowledge we cannot penetrate. I mean, and but I think, you know, your opening question, Steve, was great. Like, how'd you get this thing published? Maybe that March, you know, we're going up this hill from private knowledge that everyone needs to be aware of to, to entering that into common knowledge. 
I think we are seeing maybe some iterative progress towards that, but I, I don't know what the thing is that's going to blow. I mean, if the life insurance industry, you know, who makes their money off of actuarial data, who are getting decimated, if that doesn't blow it open, that's an industry. They they have no reason to hide this. Um, but the way this society and our and, and the institutions are controlled, I mean, nobody, so few people have the, the the courage and the ability to really bring it out there in a big way. And probably rightly so, because if they try, they're going to get put down. Hmm. Great work, Dr. Corey, as always. Appreciate having you on the show, everything you've done over the last few years. And uh, just it's the Lord's work, man. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Take care. Bye. And again, his website, FLCCC, that's Frontline COVID Critical Care is what that stands for. FLCCC, three C's, FLCCC.net. And I think this also, guys, goes back to uh, the Scott Atlas clip. It's not just on the institutional level. I, I think on a societal level, most people just don't want to know. I think they just, it, 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 we, we went crazy. I want to forget about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's almost like, you know, we went to Vegas and what stay, happens in Vegas stays in Vegas and we don't want to relive this. We've all just moved on. I don't want to know if I'm a ticking time bomb or not. I don't, I don't want to know if that spike proteins in my mother's milk and I pass it on to my kid or I don't want to find out, you know, that that's maybe why I couldn't get my wife pregnant. I don't, I don't want to know these things. And so I just let's just act like this period of time never happened let's just all move on and i don't I, I i i don't think it's just the institutions i think it's societal too yeah and that being said because he won't live by lies like that i i got how on earth you see him in his scrubs again he isn't isn't he at university hospital in madison wisconsin yeah he was yeah that's whether he's still there or I not i don't know but, but he, he was he's still working yeah we've seen what happened to peter mccullen dr ryan call i I wish I would have had a chance uh, to chime in just to ask him, how do you still have a job? He was just on Tucker. Mm. Like, you, if he's still in Madison, in Madison Wisconsin, you like, you you are a bull in a china shop that does not tolerate this kind of uh, dissent. Well, there's uh, some courage, though, that's, oh, that, that's lacking in other places. I, yeah. It's profound. I just We've seen them go after giants before, and it's amazing. Uh, God bless you, uh, Dr. Corey, for what you're doing. Aaron? Isn't it curious how the pursuit of mammon is so, so widespread in our society, except for when it except for when it requires courage. You know what he was talking about, the uh, life insurance companies? There's very little appetite. They're, this is hurting their bottom line. Right. These are companies designed for profit, and yet crickets when their profits are being hurt. Mammon is good until it you know, takes courage to continue acquiring it. We'll come back. Theology Thursday is next. And we're back with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and all of you. And you can all, hopefully though not all at once, let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Email us, steve at stevedace.com. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. You can follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter, Gitter, Instagram, and TikTok. By the way, can I just say, even though it has probably 10, 15% of the traffic as an app. MeWe is just a lot easier to use than Facebook is in that same genre. It looks cleaner, a lot easier to use. It's an underrated app. Needs a little bit more traffic, publicity. But uh, we've got, I think, around 30,000 followers on there, which given the size of that app is pretty good. Um, so clearly I'm not the only one who thinks that way. Uh, if you listen to the podcast, you can also leave us a five-star review if you like us, of course, uh, and make sure to hit subscribe or if you're on iTunes, it's now follow. That way, every time we do a new episode, it shows up in your feed every single time. So I got a, uh, a call from, uh, yet from, uh, corporate, uh, the other yesterday saying, Hey, we're going to do a big push for Cabrini saw your review. They want to do your show. Do you have a problem with it? I said, no, not at all. I mean, I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to spin. I'm not going to lie, but I'd be happy to do it because I do think it's a, it, Cabrini. Um, the, the, the film that's out right now, it's the latest from Angel Pictures. It is the best quality film they've ever done. It's a better movie than even Sound of Freedom. Uh, in terms of the, the craftsmanship, uh, it's a gorgeous film to look at. It is beautifully shot. This is a very high-end film. And if it were made by a mainstream studio and not Angel, I mean, I, I could see this film as is without changing one line of dialogue in the entire film, um, I, I could see this film being uh, Academy Award worthy. I, you may not see a better made drama this year. Now, I have some worldview complications with the film, which I addressed in my review on all my social medias. Now, someone whose opinion I respect, John Zamerick over at the stream, he had a counter review. Um, and I wonder... This is why I would love for you to see it, Todd. I, I wonder if it's just, I'm not Catholic. And so the, the very specific notions of her ministry or concepts and ideals of her ministry, I don't, I don't have an attachment to, you know? So I'm only looking at it from the broader worldview perspective. But it is, it's an absolutely wonderfully made film. And I'm all about people in our line of work making better movies. You know, I teamed up with a group over at Believe Entertainment uh, for Nefarious to try to do our part in raising the bar. This movie certainly does that in terms of its quality. It's an extremely well done film. So um, if you already have watched the film, uh, you can uh, also riff about your personal experience here in theaters now. If you want to purchase tickets uh, in advance online, you can do that at angel.com slash Steve. That's angel.com slash Steve. Let us know what you think. If you think uh, that uh, my worldview issues with the movie are completely bunk and I, that, that I'm wrong. There's plenty of people that do think that. I heard from you guys in my mentions. But I do want to tell you guys that this is an exceptionally well-made film. Exceptionally well-made. All right, so get advanced tickets today. Angel.com slash Steve. That's angel.com slash Steve. You have not seen this yet, right? I have not. Just I really haven't had time yet. But it, you know, maybe this weekend, if my wife and I can uh, sneak away, we'll try I would to pencil love it. it in. I would love it. And then I would love to see what your thoughts on it were as a Catholic, because I don't have the the personal connection to this story. I mean, I, I guess maybe I do, you know, I'm the on some level, I'm a descendant of Sicilian and Italian immigrants, and that's who the movie is about, you know, primarily. Um, but it's, uh, I did have some worldview issues with the film. I did. I articulated them at the time. So, but I certainly would recommend seeing it in terms of a, the quality of the film that it is. I mean, Angel Studios really raised the bar with the level of craftsmanship here. And the good news is, um, as well, haven't we been saying that a lot in the, uh, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it faith-based or conservative or alternative, you know, maybe it's all those things. We've been saying that a lot the last few years. Hey, this Jesus Revolution did that or Sound of Freedom did that, right? The last few years we have said quite a bit, this is really raising the bar uh, unplanned. We said that about that at the time. This movie takes it to another level. I mean, the quality of this production is Oscar worthy. It is. Whether we're going to agree on the worldview, it asserts, is a different topic, but I don't think anybody could argue against the quality of the film itself. It's, it's masterfully uh, shot, filmed, and constructed. So angel.com slash Steve is where you want to go for that. All right, let's get to some Theology Thursday. And this is our last Theology Thursday before we um, begin our verse-by-verse -verse study of Romans. And again, we have no idea how long that is going to take. We don't. It's going to take as long as it takes. In fact, we were talking about it off the air yesterday. You guys think we're going to be doing this in the next year? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't... You don't think we'll be done with it by the end of the year? No way. I don't know how. No way? No. Okay. There's going to be other things that come in here. Emergency yeah, Theology Thursdays. Sure, we're going to have to address that. Okay, if you're factoring that in, I could see it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, we maybe it's a wait and see, figure it out as you go along. But I mean, we... 
once we get into this, we may need to like on the go set up like how do we move on when we when we just have to agree like we have not we haven't solved anything. We could send, right? spend an entire hour on one verse yeah, every now and then. Right. We're, we're the same place we are where we started. Like, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I don't have an example in my head for that, but I don't know. Well, I mean, we're going to get into... Uh, I, I think I said this to you guys off the air the other day when we were uh, kind of planning it out. We're going to get into virtually every divisive topic within the orthodox small O Christian community. Um, predestination, election, Israel, the church. Um, we're we're going to touch on all of those things. I mean, it, Romans does not... I mean, <laughs> we are going to touch on a lot of topics that are divisive even amongst... Uh, and, and, and fundamental disagreements even amongst our own core audience. Yeah. Which makes which makes me wonder if this is a very smart business move on our. Well, it's, listen, <laughs> is I it mean, a savvy it's, business move on our part? It's not new Should territory. We, let's go. The, let's do the Gospel of John. Everybody loves that. We did. Okay? The, I mean, we did the Reformation thing uh, before. Oh, but now I'm going to have. I'm going to now. Now the reformers are going to disagree. All right. So yeah, we did the Reformation thing before, but there were still some unified tribes there. Yours so and you mine. So you envision a scenario? Oh where, my! God. We're, we're going to get into stuff that the reformers are going to disagree on. We're okay. Out. I'm going to have Southern Baptists. We're going to be heretics. I mean, before we even before we even convert you Catholics, I'm going to have Southern Baptists and everybody else. I mean, all all over us. Okay. By even entertaining certain viewpoints of what people think some of these the, uh, theological teachings mean. Oh, yes. So there's that meme of the Japanese actor who played Ra's al Ghul in uh, the original Batman Begins, but he's in some other movie, and there's a meme where he says, let them fight. Yes. You think that might be me, the Catholic yeah. over here, just watching yeah. you guys now disembowel I'm starting each to realize, other? Okay, now I understand why a bunch of suburban megachurch pastors don't ever preach this book. It could be real hard to build a megachurch off of this one, okay? Uh, but nevertheless, we put it out there, and now we kind of feel obligated to follow through. So we will... Uh, beginning on March 28th. So today's our last Theology Thursday until then. And um, I wanted to walk you through uh, the presentation of the gospel that we have in my new children's book, Why Easter? Um, Because I also think there is fundamental understandings of grace and law communicated in this book for children that I don't think even a lot of adults even if you're in a church right now, maybe have considered or entertained. Um, and we, we go through the Old Testament, we go through the Gospels, the New Testament, and then we take it a, an extra step into how what came out of the New Testament and out of the Gospels ended up helping to inspire America. So we're going to do a read-through of why Easter for you in the audience today. Uh, Jesus died for us so we can live forever. And then we'll discuss it. Ready to begin? Yes. All right, let's begin. America is a special place to live. We are lucky to live in a free country where many people around the world wish they could live. But why is America so special? America is special because it was founded on truths that God himself brought into the world. And it is a place where we are allowed to celebrate those beliefs. We can celebrate holidays like Easter because of how this country was created. Easter is about more than just chocolate and bunnies. Easter is a celebration of God's greatest miracle. When Jesus died for our sins and was resurrected. But why did Jesus have to do that? To understand why Easter is so important, we have to go back to the beginning. When God shared his rules for how we can live without sin. These truths begin with the Ten Commandments, which were God's first written words to us. He shared those commandments through Moses, who was a follower of God's even when it wasn't easy. With God's help, Moses saved the people of Israel from slavery to rulers who were very mean to them. Through Moses, God performed miracles that helped get his people to safety, like parting the Red Sea so the Israelites could walk on dry land to escape their enemies. After his people traveled for many months, God called Moses to a very high mountain called Mount Sinai. 
Now that God's people were free, they needed rules to show them how they should live peacefully. He gave Moses the Ten Commandments, which were written in stone so that they couldn't be erased. This way people knew how important it was to follow them. These Ten Commandments are God's law and help to show all of his believers how we should live our lives, how to obey God, and how to know right from wrong. Here are the Ten Commandments in order. Number one, God is the one true God. Anyone who says they are a God or says something else is a God is not telling the truth. Number two, don't make things and worship them as gods. It seems silly, but in the past, some people would make pretend gods out of things like wood and pray to them. God wanted his people to know that they shouldn't do that anymore. Number three, don't use God's name as a bad word or make fun of it. It's important to respect God and show him that we are thankful for all that he has done for us. Number four, take a day of rest like God did when he made the world and use that day to worship God. You can even go to church. Number five, listen to your parents. God gave you parents to help you teach you right from wrong and to keep you safe. Number six, don't kill. We should never harm another person unless we are protecting someone else's life. Number seven, make sure you love your husband or your wife more than anyone except God, and make sure you treat them kindly. Number eight, don't steal from other people and take what doesn't belong to you. Number nine, don't lie, especially to make yourself look better or to make someone else look bad. We shouldn't do bad things just because someone was bad to us. And number 10, don't be jealous of what you don't have, but be thankful for what you do have. Everyone is different and has their own gifts and talents. And when we get jealous of other people, we might say and do things that hurt others. God gave us these laws to make sure that we know how to live the best life dedicated to him. But if we don't follow his laws, there could be consequences that we don't like. Just like people today get in trouble for breaking the law, this is true of God's law too. God wanted us to know that if we don't stop doing bad things, our separation from God could last forever. Imagine being separated from the person you love the most in the world and how much you would miss them. It would be even harder to be separated from God. See, God gave each of us a soul, which is the part of us that will live forever and ever. And after our body dies, our soul wants to go to be with God where he lives in heaven. But he told us that no one who breaks his commandments can be there, so that bad people and bad things can never get in. That's why when we break God's commandments, we risk not getting to be with God forever. And as much as we'd be sad about not being with God forever, he would be even sadder not being with us, because he's the one that made us, and no one loves us more than God. God literally counted every hair on your head. He knows your name. He hears your prayers. The sad thing is, there is something inside of us that makes us want to do bad stuff sometimes. This is what God calls sin. Sometimes we don't even want to do bad stuff, but we can't always stop ourselves, and we end up breaking God's laws. This is why sometimes we can be so mean to our parents or our best friends, people we love a lot. Since we all have sin in us, we can sometimes be bad even though we don't want to be. See, God loves us so much that he gave us the ability to make choices. He didn't make us to be like players in a video game that he controls by pushing buttons. He gave us the freedom to make our own choices and showed us his love by telling us the right choices to be made. We show God we love him by obeying his commandments. So when we disobey him, we are really saying that we don't love him and that we love things that are bad for us more. But what does sin have to do with Easter? See, God also knows that sometimes we can't stop disobeying him, even if we really want to do the right thing. And he knew we needed his help. That's why God came to us in the form of a child, and his name was Jesus. This is the Christmas story you may know, starting with the little boy born in the manger that would grow up to become a mighty savior for us all. But first, Jesus chose to live like we do and face the same problems we do. Because while God, while he was fully God, he was also fully human like us. He wanted to show us that he understood everything that we go through. That's why Jesus had to have his diaper changed as a baby, just like you. He had to be potty trained and learn how to walk, talk, and read, just like you. He had to get a job to pay for his food and home as an adult, just as you will one day. And that's why he learned from his earthly dad, Joseph, how to build things with his own hands. While he grew up, Jesus lived a perfect life free of sin. And finally, once he was old enough, he announced himself to the world. 
He started to share the good news that God had made a way to save us from sin and talk about the miracles of God. He taught, he healed the sick, he cured the blind, and he made only a few fish and two loaves of bread into a giant feast. He taught that since we couldn't get to heaven because of the bad stuff we'd done, that heaven had come to us. He taught us that in order to stop disobeying God, we need to tell God we are sorry and ask him to give us the power to do what is right. The people were listening to him sharing the truth. They saw his miracles and started to believe. But there were some people who did not want to listen or believe. These people did not like that Jesus was saying he was God. And they really didn't want to hear that they needed to tell God they were sorry. So after a while, they arrested Jesus. They beat him very badly, and they put him to death on what is called a cross, which is a very painful way to die. And even when they were hurting Jesus, he didn't get mad at those who did this to him, but instead he prayed for them to be forgiven. This was his way of showing God's love and to help us to know that he is willing to forgive us for anything bad we may have done too. After he died, they put him in a tomb, which was a cave with a giant rock to cover the opening. But three days later, on the day we call Easter, the most incredible thing to ever happen took place. God rolled the giant stone that covered the tomb, rolled away the giant stone that covered the tomb, and Jesus was alive again, proving once and for all that he really was God with us. Because no one but God would have the power to come back from death. By coming back from the dead, Jesus showed us that all of his teachings were true, and we could trust him with all things. He died for our sins so that we could be forgiven and go to heaven. Jesus has promised to return someday and defeat all the evil in the world. Before he returned to heaven, Jesus gave us his spirit to help guide us away from sin and bring us to salvation. If we ask God to forgive us and thank him for raising Jesus back to life, Jesus will come and live inside of us. This way, we can be with God all the time, even before we get to heaven. This is why we celebrate Easter, to thank God for sending Jesus to die for our sins and save us. And we are lucky to live in a country where we can celebrate Easter and God's love freely. That wasn't always the case. When our country was first started, we were still under the control of a mean king who wanted to be the only one that people worshipped. Our founding fathers knew that they needed to fight for our freedom so that they could believe in God and not be controlled by the king. Since Jesus now lived inside of them, they wanted to follow God's commandments and live by them. The founding fathers called this liberty, and they were willing to stand up for it. And they did. God heard their prayers, and eventually our founding fathers won their freedom and created a new nation, the United States. One of the first things they did was make sure people had the right to go to church, read the Bible, and talk about God whenever they wanted to. Because they knew without all those things, it wouldn't be possible for a special place like America to happen. Now we are free to celebrate our love for God whenever we want, learn about Easter and the Ten Commandments, and welcome Jesus into our hearts just as the Founding Fathers did. And now you know why Easter is God's greatest miracle. For God loved us so much that he gave us his only son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for our sins and mistakes that we couldn't pay ourselves. And if we truly believe that with all our heart, then Jesus will come to live in our hearts now and we will live with Jesus forever in heaven, even after our body dies. This is why God sent his son to our world to save our world. So obviously, it requires for a more adult audience several layers of nuance and clarification. But for children, this was my best attempt to make both law, gospel, and our history uh, distilled down into a set of ideas and statements and a story that they could absorb and understand. So guys, what do you think? Well, I told you at the time, uh, uh, I think the, the best accomplishment of all this is what you did uh, to help kids and families uh, when, when you go to America, after explaining uh, the the entire uh, Easter story, and then how you uh, that relates to America's uh, existence and its founding, when you go it to it, how you go to it, the amount of time you spend on it accomplishes a very important thing. It helps you understand America without unduly anointing America, which I think is a really, really important distinction. It is, it is not 
the new Israel. It's certainly inspired by it. But look at the America. You, I mean, look at the America you wrote this book in, Steve. Mm -hmm. It's... You know, it's hollowed out. It's gutted. But it... it, it That's right, one of the nuances for adults. Yeah, but yes, yes, yes. But yeah. it, I, I just think it's... That, you pulled it off, and that was a really, really tricky thing. The other thing I really like about it, that this, it hit me, particularly this time. I mean, it's just two pages, but when you talk about Christmas, and there's a story of a young Jesus, and you mentioned uh, uh, Jesus going up to be a carpenter, there, there's... There's discussions about the, the lost years of Jesus, which, oh, by the way, is like almost his entire life. But there's, again, planted within that, you know, we're planting mustard seeds here and how you grow into them as an adult. And kids will, you know, remember this as an adult. The, the, the early uh, uh, theological understanding of fully God and fully man and how important that fully man thing is in there, that... that being incarnate meant most of Jesus's life was acting on the fully man part to the nth degree. Just uh, walking the earth, talking, eating, being a part of people, learning a trade, and how how much of that then is ultimately inside of that cross, dying, you, you know. It, you, you can get so easy theologically in terms of angels dancing on the head of a pin. God could have just had 13-year-old Jesus, 7-year-old Jesus come down like some kind of... 30-year-old uh, Jesus. But it, it, it's some ch wonderkin child who's mm -hmm. just... And he, it was really important that we understand that that march through history, that Jesus himself lived made his death on the cross, understanding you uniquely as an individual. It's all in there. And that's just two pages, man. That's why there's like, like with any passage within the Bible, this book accomplishes, like you could sit there and talk with your child for an hour of just about two pages. And that's the goal of the book is to help spark and inspire that conversation that will be ongoing as they grow up and it'll be time to fill in some of those nuances like not all some of our founding fathers clearly were believers some of them clearly were not but those are tough nuances to describe to a four-year-old especially because even the ones that were not were still greatly inspired by christian morality ethic a biblical it, understanding it of the world, culture. right? It there was the culture that they were a part of, right? But those are nuances and stuff. You can fill in those blanks as they get older and are more capable of absorbing them for now. This is an attempt, Aaron, to just to, to strike up a conversation yep. that every previous generation of Americans were frankly able to take for granted without a book like this. Yeah. And uh, by the way, this is the first time that I've actually read or listened to this this book. I knew we were going to be doing something like this at some point. Didn't know until this morning it would be this morning. And even putting up the, the slides there, I didn't read the book. And so I'm reacting to this fresh for the first time. And I think you nailed one particular section. And that's the section talking about sin and even getting into agency in decision making and um, how it hurts God's heart to be separated uh, from him. I think talking about mustard seeds, I pray that a book like this, because of that section and the context with which it is presented, which is the full encapsulation of the gospel, but especially that section, I hope it finds its way into uh, the hands of children whose parents may not be fully maybe catechized or uh, taught or even aware of the impacts of sin. Maybe even believers, Todd's, uh, Todd's uh, admonition multiple times to see your children, even your little babies as sinners, that's rife within Christian, Amer Christian America as well. And so children are brought up in environments where sin really isn't talked about or discussed, much less its impacts. And I thought, you know, in terms of adult nu nuance, you know, talking about hell turn or burn, those are conversations sometimes you need to have with other adults. Thus saith the Lord, thou art the man. That, those are the types of conversations with adults that need to be had sometimes. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, those are the types of tones that you need to strike sometimes in conversations with adults. But in children, how do you get them starting to think about sin? I make choices. Some of them are bad. Or when I do make bad choices, it hurts God's heart. How do you start to have those conversations? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great, it is a confrontational way 
but it's not a turn or burn sort of manner. And emphasizing that you're hurting the heart of God when you sin and you make these decisions, I think that can resonate even with the small children who will read this book. So I do hope, especially that section, again, in the, in the context of the entire book, I hope that section will find its way into the hands of a lot of children who probably need to hear it and maybe, maybe have not. Well, I appreciate that because that's exactly why we wrote it the way that we did. I mean, the, uh, we, I'm assuming your children are going to have questions whether it's in your class or in your church or your youth group or your Sunday school or at home, I, I, I'm assuming they're going to have questions after reading this. And um, that's the point, is to have those questions. Uh, we, don't, we don't say it as much as we used to, but when we first started the show, you know, one of our taglines is we're not trying to win an argument, we're trying to start one. That, you know, a lot of the conversations that we need to have, fundamental conversations that we need to have as a people, we are not having. And um, before we go for the close, we have to actually have a pitch, right? I mean, what's what's the pitch here? What's What, what are we trying to do before I ask you for the sale? What is it we're even selling? And I would imagine there are a not insignificant amount of people in this, even in this audience, the, the connection between the Old and New Testaments, between the Ten Commandments given to Moses. Um, I mean, what, what I wanted this book to do was embody what John says, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I wanted this book to embody that. I would imagine there are a lot of people in this audience who have never heard that connection on any level, even as, even as fundamentally simple it's much more complicated than what I wrote in this book. I mean, but even as fundamentally simple as what is presented here, I would imagine there really aren't a lot of people that have, even in this audience, heard that kind of connection. And I, I would imagine we might be disappointed at the amount of people who are sincere believers, sincere Christians, who will be commemorating what was done for them this, you know, at the end of this month, who probably have not heard that. In this audience, yeah. is that fair? Yeah. 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 Which means what do you think is the case culture wide when we get outside of our sliver of the sliver? What's it what's it like in the broader culture, do you think? Yeah, well, we're going to pick up this in our first week of doing Romans. Yeah. Because once we talk, we're going to do an introduction talking about the culture, Judaizers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You just said it's much more detailed and deep. That's what you're alluding to Correct. with the law versus grace. Yes. Yeah. We'll come back. It'll be three non-political questions when we do. Back in a minute. Patriot Mobile has been on the cutting edge of building the parallel economy for about a decade now. And thankfully, it's with a product that these days you cannot thrive in modern society without. Of course, I'm talking about your mobile phone. Make the switch to Patriot Mobile today. Once you're a part of their family, their customer service team, just they're an outstanding U.S.-based, meaning you can understand them, uh, customer service team, they will take complete uh, care of you. Anytime you need to switch, if you move to another part of your state or uh, some other state where one network is not as good as it was where you once were and you need to switch, you can switch anytime you want for free. Just one of the things they do for you as a member at Patriot Mobile. And to help you switch, they'll make it as customer customized as possible. Keep your current number, your current phone, change your number, upgrade your phone, whatever you want to do, they'll customize it for you at Patriot Mobile. If you're a veteran or first responder, let them know when you go to make the switch and they've got extra ways to say thank you for your service. All of us can use my name, Steve, as the offer code to get a free activation at patriotmobile.com slash Steve. That's patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Once again, patriotmobile.com slash Steve. All right, it's time for three non-political questions. 
We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? A question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on the Steve Day Show. Indeed it is. Each of us has been charged this week with coming up with one of those non-political questions. Why is that? Because Aaron completely forgot about it yep. until the commercial break. So I, I was going to let it slide, actually. But you have Janet yelling like self-awareness and humility today. Aaron. I got so, a congratulations. score on the worldview checkup. That's all I need. <laughs> Aaron's, Aaron's, Aaron's integrity is like our inflation transitory. All right, who wants to go first? I can go first. All right. I'll make it up. Since, Aaron, you can do the do the honors. Since um, and I just came up with my question within the last forty five seconds. Actually. As I came up with mine about <laughs> forty five seconds before that. Yes. So I don't know if you y- y- y'all have been I, I already start, starting to talk like her. <clears throat> I don't know if y'all have been following this story about Hannah Barron. Some like I don't know Eastern European. Is this the pretty girl that was that, does, d- does, d- does, the does the fishing the, and hunting the catfish noodling? Yeah, where okay. she goes and catches catfish. Right, with her I, I saw that this thing was trending. What is what is going on now? So People were saying she's masculine I, or I something. I saw the very first tweet about this last Saturday morning, and it's been blowing up ever ever since. So it was some woman. She looks like she has had several inject- injections of Botox. She does not. She's had a lot of work done. And she was on Twitter and she was commenting on a video of this Hannah Barron, who I'd never heard of before. Um, This Hannah Barron is a Southern gal. I think she's from Southern Alabama. She's got a very deep Southern accent. That's kind of charming. Southern accents on chicks are hot. Well, yeah, the the South Alabama. There's a chick on ESPN, Wendy Dix. I don't know how good of a reporter she is. I I used to watch every show she was on just to hear talk. And she just she goes through. She's she's uh, helping her dad build her dream home. Like, really cool. Like, she's staying in wood. She's helping her dad. She's got, I guess, other videos where she's, like, out there doing kind of manual labor with her dad. She's catfishing, hunting, all of this stuff with her dad. And anyway, so she's got this deep uh, southern accent. And this woman comments on this video and said, accents like this in women should be illegal. Um, If you think that a tomboy like this is attractive, you're probably gay. Something like that. And this woman, of course, from her profile picture and other other pictures that people have surfaced from her, she looks like she's had a lot of work done. So obviously, a bunch of people came to Hannah Barron's defense. Sorry, I'm taking a long time to set up this this uh, conversation. A lot of people came to Hannah Barron's defense, defending her, saying, no, this is actually really cool, blah, 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 I'm on their side. But then, but then, a lot of people started noticing there is a lot of product placement. I'm not going to say the name of the product. There's a lot of product placement going on in Hannah Barron's videos that keep prop- popping up online uh, from one particular company. Do you think that this was o- an organic kind of rise to even bigger stardom? She already had a huge following on Instagram and TikTok, as I understand. Do you think this is an organic kind of rise to fame on Twitter, or is something else going on? Do you think that they planted this? Yeah, as 4D chess. Is that what I you're don't thinking? think that's possible. I think she probably just had these uh, sponsorships prior to this whole thing going on. I don't think so. But what do you think? I I think um, either this is so based on what you described. I think either this is one of the greatest marketing is, gimmicks of yes. all time. Yes. Or, Say what you want about that particular co- company, if you yes. Want. Or one of the the greatest organic viral marketing efforts to occur in uh, in recent memory. One of the two. I'm gonna I'm gonna say more than likely the latter, just because I would like to think that we have that level of cunning <laughs> in, in in our institutions making decisions still capable of pulling something like that off, but. Folks, I have my doubts. Yeah. 
Okay. I'm, I'm more inclined to think that a chick that's had way too much work done went after another pretty girl because she likes hanging out with her dad and, and, and the immediacy of social media, uh, did not permit her the restraint to avoid showing her ass, uh, and, and, and blew up on her and turned Hannah Bar Hannah Barron, almost said Hannah Barbera, <laughs> Hannah Barron, even, even into an even bigger star star online than you say she previously was. That, that seems more inclined in the era in which we live. I, I don't think that level of cunning or strategery, uh, I don't think we see much evidence of that in our institutions anymore on any level. Todd? Yeah, I'm with you, especially since, and I do believe these are cousins related, uh, what happened since the release of the, um, what was it around the new year? The, the, ca- the conservative women's calendar, oh, you yeah. know, uh, listen, there. I mean, somebody just came at me today, actually, uh, on the women's sports issue, women in sports issue, and saying, "Man, what's what good is women's sports?" And I looked at his site. It's not just a pure troll thing, retweeting conservative stuff all the time. But says, "What good is women's sports for other than uh, creating lesbians and distracting them from their primary task of being child bearers?" Like we. To your point, Steve, we are very clearly, deeply confused about like what the boundaries are for authentic femininity, authentic womanhood. So yeah, I think the I think the cat fight on here is real and it's spectacular and it's clearly not even a one off. There's there's issues. All right. Before we get to question two. There are issues in the real estate market and and looking at the amount of uh, signs in my neighborhood right now, more than we've had the last few years, it looks like a lot of people are going to attempt to navigate them nevertheless, just tired of it. I mean, people got to move. They're sitting on too much equity. uh, There's too much inventory. There's too much of a glut of homes. Eventually, people get antsy and just accept that these are the conditions we have to live with now. And it looks like that's about to happen, at least anecdotally what I'm seeing in my hood. What are you saying? Anyway. If that's going to be you, make sure you've got an agent that you can rely on. Just go to realestateagentsitrust.com to find yourself one of those. All right. Uh, These are agents that are the best in your area, among the top sellers. They know the lay of the land, the best practices to get your family where you want to go, whether that's just another home where you currently live or you got to completely live someplace differently. They can help you. Name says it all. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Again, that's realestateagentsitrust.com. Todd, question two. Well, you were men- you mentioned uh, yesterday in some context about how the the number one budgetary item in all states is education, mm-hmm. and the number one payout in all of those budgets is manpower mm-hmm. is you, is paying the people. To that end, uh, you gave me the opportunity to, to briefly speak. I'm not going to argue, speak. I'm just interested to hear the answers after Nick Saban spoke yesterday. Uh, about um, uh, what's going on with the name, image, and likeness and all that. Th- there was some kind of press release or interview, and the uh, the uh, Alabama AD spoke about the economic realities of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And he flat out said that, you know, th- there is, you, you do this, the costs are, even P- Alabama, D1 power programs are going to have to get rid of sports. Uh, the Olympic sports, things like that. They just will not be able to exist. There's not enough money to sustain such a thing. Which sports, at which schools, whatever. And also at smaller schools, non-power fives, we risk, and I've you've heard me predict this before, entire athletic programs are just, they're just going to say it's not worth it. What is your response to that painted reality? I think uh, Greg Byrne, the AD at Alabama, said that if you take football and men's basketball and the revenue they draw away, their athletic department would operate at like a $40 million deficit, I believe that's what he said, minus those two sports. It was, yeah, I don't remember the like exact that. number, but it, yes, he did. Um, I, I think that... I, I think that um, they're, they're in a no-win scenario. They cannot enforce rules. They, they, every time they attempt to enforce rules against inducements to players uh, in any form, they go to courts and lose. 
like the NCA just did with what's gone on at Tennessee with using name, image, and likeness, not as you're selling your likeness to some third party uh, because they view you as a marketing value, uh, but as an inducement to get you to come to school there. All right. They, they went to federal court and the federal court, uh, or the judge already told them in his initial uh, read of the case, you're going to lose. Okay. They, they, every time they try to enforce rules against financially compensating players in any form, they lose in court. So there's no enforcement teeth. That means you have a tier of programs that are, that, are, that are behaving as if there are no rules and a tier of programs that are not. And you can't have that. Uh, that, that that's not sustainable. You just can't. I mean, you're going to have to come up with a uniform system. The uniform system they're going to come up with is they're going to end up revenue sharing TV money with the players. That's what they're going to end up doing. All right. I think you'll and 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 what that does and, and I, because you're not you're, you're not going to have a system for you're already seeing some NIL collectives dry up because you're seeing alumni and stuff saying so wait a minute you guys keep all this hundreds of millions of dollars from the TV networks and then we pay the players for you too no nope, that's not going to work so there's going to be a revenue sharing plan it will be in the next year or two I don't think it'll be much beyond that. It'll include TV money. It'll go into some form of collective for the players. They'll either have a, a professional association bargain, collectively bargain for them, or they'll be outright unionized. Um, and, and I think that's how they'll get around Title IX. Uh, they'll say, well, we don't have to pay the rowing team and the track and field team and everything else because this money is coming from a third party. It's coming from the TV side of things. It's not coming from, uh, it's not coming from the university. So, this, so Title IX doesn't apply. And that might be one way that these sports can survive. Um, because they are all – what Greg Byrne is telling you is nothing else here makes money except football and men's basketball. Nothing else does. Everything else is a is a point of diminishing returns, is a subsidy. That's what he's telling you, the $88. So Alabama. is that the that – my so question I, is, I think, is that the condition for sports continuing to exist? I think that's what it will have to lot, take for them to continue. A lot of yeah. women's rowing team, lacrosse, underwater basket weaving, what have you, are going to be put in a position, if they're even lucky – of proving that the value they provide outweighs the loss leader that they are um, in a t- terms of dollars and cents. It's similar to every single government job is a loss leader, economically speaking. Obviously, a policeman, a fireman, first responders, the value that they provide greatly, in my estimation, outweighs the dollar and cents hit that they have on the budget of our uh, tax dollars, what, what, what have you. Similarly, you're a lot of these programs, sports programs at every single level, are going to have to show that the value that they provide outweighs the dollars Correct. and cents that they're that yep. they're losing. So I don't know. That would be my question back. That that's my answer to the question. And the way to get back. around that is to just let them deal directly with the TV networks. So this isn't in any way fundamentally a sporting enterprise anymore. It it's not in any way an amateur enterprise anymore. So um, before we get to question number three. Remember our buddy uh, Eric July, uh, we had him on the show a couple of years ago, started his own, um, really his own graphic uh, novels and comic books with Ripaverse because of how woke the comic book universe has gotten. They basically have ruined comics uh, in that industry and sales are way down. Well, Ripaverse is that product that still believes in the magic of culture. It's non-woke comic books. They're a big hit with readers and Yiru. Uh, is the number is their Yiru number one is the current pre-order campaign that just launched. It's a 90-page graphic novel that promises to wow you with stunning cinematic action throughout and answer burning questions about uh, the Ripper versus resident femme fatale. Starting with I think it's Isom number one. They've had three back-to-back million-dollar-plus campaigns. That's an incredible amount of independent success. All right, so they're hoping to make this the fourth. They put out their first live action trailer to promote the book. Ripaverse is completely independent. You can uh, the pre order campaign ends May twenty fifth. Orders will go out immediately. You can visit Ripaverse slash Ripa Ripa R I P P A I should say Ripaverse dot com slash Y A I R A. That's how Yiru, Yiru is spelled. Y A I R A. Ripaverse dot com slash Y-A-I-R-A to pre-order. That's ripaverse.com slash Y-A-I-R-A. All right, question three on the topic of sports. If you could go back in time before you were born to have the best seat in the house for any sporting event, again, before you were born, which one would it be and why? Todd, you go first. Hmm... 
think I'll go with, um, how about the ice ball? Iconic. And, and what's the best seat in the house for you for that? Well, it's, it's right down in that end zone. <laughs> that counts. But. Let me pick the most painful fan experience yeah. I could come up with, and I'm there. That is a very totters an answer. That is a very totters an answer. Oh, making sports great again? I would. I'd, I'd. You know what I'd do? I, I'd. I'd get rid of like all of TV. You'd have if you really want to love sports, you go get in that arena. It's way we're making it way too easy on people to be gluttons of this stuff. So yeah, get down there, bundle up. The ice bowl. For people that don't know what that is, um, uh, I believe that was the game that determined who went to Super Bowl one, right? Yes. Uh, and uh, the Packers played the Cowboys in Green Bay. At the time, it was the coldest NFL game on record. Still may be. I, I don't know. It's certainly up there. I don't think it there. is anymore, but it was but, cool. but, um, And the Cowboys beat the Dallas or, – or the Packers beat the Cowboys on a quarterback sneak, as I recall, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and ended up uh, going to Super Bowl one against – was it the Chiefs yeah, or the Raiders? The, Ch- the Chiefs. Yeah, well, Super Bowl one, one is first. The, the Chiefs. Is the Chiefs. Chiefs. And Super Chiefs Bowl two was the Raiders. Okay, yeah. and uh, ended up beating the Kansas City Chiefs out in Super Bowl one. It wasn't called the Super Bowl yet. They didn't call the Super Bowl. I think until Super Bowl three is when it was first called that, or maybe four. Aaron, what about you? Man, for some reason, um, uh, you know, Super Bowl four. That's my answer. Super Bowl four. I first went to what was that moment with Mark McGuire? Uh, when he he didn't he set some sort of record I can't remember uh, for some the home reason. run record yeah it's, there was something like that that was 1998 you were alive that's true <laughs> dang I just used to be a Cardinals fan that's all what what about you 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 really 1957 you when really the Lions won a cha- last won a championship 1957 uh, yeah, that's obvious Romans a 28.